Hi, I'm Chris Nessie from the House of EdTech podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to right now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hey, welcome back. Steve here. And today I'm talking with Kathy Joseph. She has a focus on physics and engineering, but also on showing that historical context is the best way to teach science. Her latest book is The Lightning Tamers, true stories of the dreamers and schemers who harnessed electricity and transformed our world. What a powerful talk. What an amazing discussion. You are going to learn so much. You're going to love this. And uh, by the way, before you go, it'd be so cool if you went to my website, stephenmaletto.com slash reviews and left a review for me. Could you do that? Say a few nice words, maybe give five stars. Hmm? <laughs> Thanks so much. Enjoy the show. It's the education podcast, your favorite show, with lots of groovy guests, and they share what they know. So crank it up the tin and let your neighbors know that here's another show with Dr. Steve Milletto. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Ah, ah, with Dr. Steve Milletto. Kathy Joseph splits her time between writing her next book, making documentary videos based on her books for her YouTube channel, and giving talks about the history of science and the importance of context for learning science. Kathy attributes her novel's depth and breadth partially to her YouTube channel, Kathy Loves Physics. She uses her channel to test out her ideas in documentary form and learn from her brilliant viewers, making this book an interactive experience. Despite her simple video format, Kathy has hit a nerve, and her channel has over 9.5 million views. Oh my gosh, she's almost at 10 million views, and over 145,000 subscribers. Woohoo! Yeah, wow. <laughs> Kathy also puts all her scripts on her website and dives into other fascinating scientific topics on her blog, spanning a broad range of topics like the history of the Nobel Prize, the birth of wireless, and the early history of quantum mechanics. Kathy has earned uh, multiple degrees in physics and engineering and was a high school physics teacher. She is an alumnus of the University of Chicago, Penn State, and the University of Utah. Kathy lives near San Francisco with her fabulous husband, Mike, her amazing children, Alicia and Alex, and one very cranky cat aptly named Brutus. Learn more at www.kathylovesphysics.com. Our focus today will be all kinds of stuff, but really taking a look at the role that history Ha plays in science and uh, so forth and some great stories as well as her latest book the lightning tamers true stories of the dreamers and schemers who harnessed electricity and transformed our world kathy thanks for joining me today say hi to everyone hi everyone and thank you Stephen, for having me on well i'm so glad you're here and uh, i gotta start this way i mean where'd your interest in physics come from i mean what, what made you say this is what i want to do I got to say, it came from, I'm from San Francisco. Actually, my, I'm from outside of San Francisco. And my family moved to San Francisco when I was seven. And I got taken to the Exploratorium, which is a hands-on science museum. And I just instantly clicked with it. It's just full of all these things. And they tell you what to try to do with it. Or you can just play with it on your own. And then it, when you follow their instructions, it does something surprising. And then you turn over the page and it says why it does that surprising thing. And to me, it felt like it was a whole bunch of magician's tricks where the magician was telling you, now this is where I hid the rabbit and this is where I put the ball and this is how I made it all look like it did. So for me, I just found physics magical and because it let me just run from place to place, it worked really well with my brain that doesn't, I could just, Oh, this is fascinating. Oh, well, this one, this one, this one, this one. I mean, I love it so much that when I turned 16, my friends kidnapped me, blindfolded me and then took me to the exploratorium. Nice. <laughs> because that was my, that was my happy place. That's awesome. That's so cool. All right. So yeah, now I, I got to tell you, and just as a note, you know, it's, it's, there's such cool things with, with physics. I mean, I, I, I had, I had my share of blast with uh, learning it and understanding and, uh, you know, and then, uh, then having it the more, the one that's more experimental based and then getting a chance to have the one that's more mathematics based. It's a surrogate learning how calculus played a role in it and stuff like this. And I still though, am fascinated by just 
all the the cool properties that are out there and how people f- figured these things out. And I'm a former history teacher. I, I have a bachelor's and master's in history and and uh, you know that was that was my thing. And and I say that because it's not not social studies. Not that there's anything wrong with that. That's not my point. <laughs> but history. And this is so cool how you know in in your lightning tamers you history is part of science and it's just all there and I love that. So you know what I'd like to do is uh, you know when you wrote this book what did you what did you what really kind of stood out as something you learned while writing this book? Oh that's a fabulous question. So what initially inspired me to write this book is that I was talking to a woman and she was asking me about what I did. And I told her about teaching physics in high school. And I'd mentioned that one of my, I'd asked my students where electricity came from. And one of my students proudly said the wall. And I'm like the wall. And she's like the plug in the wall. And I was telling her this story. And now I asked the students, where is this plug in the wall came from? And they had no idea. And So I told this woman the story and she said that she might have thought of a generator or like a power station, but she wouldn't, she didn't know anything about what it meant. And she said something like, I'm not good at that stuff. I'm not smart enough to understand that stuff. And I'm thinking this woman was clearly very intelligent. And it just hit me how many, how many adults go through schooling And they don't become scientists. And then they have such low scientific literacy. And then that does two things. One, it it can make them feel like they're stupid, even though, you know, this woman was a lawyer, very successful. It wasn't she was stupid. It just was taught to her in a way that didn't stick with her and wasn't meaningful. And that... Also, it makes it really easy to fall for pseudoscience. Two things I don't like. (laughs) So I thought, well, maybe I'll just try to write something where I use the history to teach the science, thinking it would be easier for people to understand if it had a a story attached. But I didn't think I would learn anything new in physics. I thought I'd learn about the history and they would learn about the physics and the history. Like, you know, I'm, I have a lot of degrees. I'm like, I got this basic stuff. And I just over and over and over again, looking into the history, I learned so much. I, I, it just, every single part of it, it made it have more depth. It made it had more meaning. And sometimes I realized I kind of misunderstood something and it was, it was just, I, I found it magical. And I think that once I started, after about a year, I started a YouTube channel because I asked a friend what I should do with myself. And she's like, and I'm like, should I start a blog? And she's like, Kathy, you talk a lot. Start a YouTube channel. <laughs> nice, nice. So I did and I love it. But also like, I think that's why it resonated so much is because people don't expect the history with the real physics. But it, it really does teach you the physics in a much more profound and deeper way and easier. And that seems great to me. Oh, that's awesome. So. It really is. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's something that, uh, just as a note, I mean, a lot of times, unfortunately, the way it's taught to us is in some sort of, you know, yeah, you could kind of figure out there's history there, but really – this is the thing I need you to remember. And yeah, there's so much other stuff, but that's not my point. My point is I need you to remember this formula or I need you to be able to do this in this class and in in this experiment. And uh, this is why I need you to do that. But as opposed to kind of putting together the story of even how it came about, I mean, the whole, the whole thing about the wall is amazing. Oh yeah. I, I was thinking the other thing is that teaching the science through the history is what we used to do all the time. Like if you read old science papers from the 1800s, they almost always start with since the time of Gilbert, blah, 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 blah. No, nobody nowadays would write that because nobody knows who Gilbert is or was. 
Gilbert was Queen Elizabeth's doctor who wasn't too busy being her doctor because she wouldn't let anyone touch her. And he was told by either Sir Francis Drake or Sir Francis Drake's um, sailors that in the Southern Hemisphere, there's no North Star. So the compasses don't point at the North Star. And he was like, oh, wow, maybe the Earth is a magnet. So he gets this natural magnet called a lodestone. He grinds it down into a sphere. He puts it on a string and he hangs it up and it spins around itself every 24 hours. And he's like, look, not only am I proving that the Earth is a magnet, I'm also proving that the Earth spins around its own axis. And this is like between 1580 and 1600. This was this was dangerous things to say at the time. And then he also studies electricity, like st static electricity, rubbing things to see if it's the same as magnets. And he's like, well, it's different. Like I can do a magnetic experiment on a humid day. Totally works fine. Same. I tried the static electricity. Doesn't work on a humid day. Just like you go to Vegas, you get z z z zapped every day. You go to Mississippi, nothing. <laughs> no zap in the vault at all. And so, but he didn't travel like that. So he, but he knew he could figure out like on humid days, he would record everything. And so he named electricity after the first thing he had heard of that had this property, which is amber. And the ancient word for amber was electra or something like that, or electron, or it, it depends on who you ask. But anyway, he named it after that. So electricity named after jewelry. But all the people in the 1800s, they knew this. They knew where it came from because they were taught it. But we're not. So we're just like, okay, here are the rules for electricity. Here's the rules for magnets. And everyone writes it down. And then they forget it all because it, it doesn't have any meaning. Which is sad, by the way. That's you know, because because I have to say this because one of the things I love about uh, about reading your writings is that as you're dealing with this history, these people knew each other. They're they're they may not realize that they you know they're they're celebrities of their day, but I, I mean, hey, I mean, Gilbert knew or came in contact with Francis Drake, or in, you know, this yeah. this is a yeah, you know, this is a known. Uh, legal type of pirate here right and and he he's hobnobbing with him i'm nice i mean that's i like that you know and queen elizabeth and galileo read his work right. um i didn't include that in the book but galileo read his book and it really inspired him and it was part of the reason he starts talking about you know the um sun-centered version of yes. the earth and i mean part of the reason not the copernicus view Part of the reason he was doing it, part of the reason he started studying magnets. And and it, it was really, it, it's amazing to me how all these people, and especially in the 1800s, oh my gosh, early 1800s, they're all knowing each other. They're all commenting on each other. It's crazy. That is so awesome because it's, you're just thinking about it. It's like, uh, you know, it uh, the whole thought that uh, they're they're interacting with one another and, uh, you know, and eventually they're going to just have this major impact that we don't realize uh, that they, they're they're going to have some knowledge of, but not probably the scope, uh, or at least some of them might know that scope. Just fascinating stuff. I, You know, one of the things I got to get back and ask you, though, is, I mean, why do you think that we don't know those stories today? Or, I mean, why, why is it that we don't really know the history? I mean, why do you think that it's not taught? I think there's two reasons. One the technology started to make a lot of money in after the telegraph, but specifically after the telephone, the light bulbs and stuff like that. And once it started to make a lot of money, it was sort of dangerous to find the real story because the real story is always complicated. I mean, we think of it as like emerging fully formed from someone's head as uh, Marie Curie said, like, um, Minerva emerging from Zeus's head. Like we think of it as a series of disconnected stories of great men and women, mostly men. And it's not. It's each discovery is so slightly different from the one before. Even the ones that have huge impacts, they, they're not 
wholly different from what happened. It's just maybe at a slightly different temperature or slightly different material or, you know, combining two things together or something like that. And so all discoveries are complicated. They're not like this person discovered this thing at this date. It's like this person saw this thing and remembered this old thing and tried it again. And it didn't work the way they wanted it to, but it worked a slightly different way. And they said, what's going on here? And like that. And if you want to have a patent lawsuit, you don't want any of those subtleties. You want it to be like this person did this on this date. So in technology, they start cutting out the, you know, the history. And in physics, we kept on doing it a little bit. And I'm going to blame a man named Richard Feynman, one of the greatest scientists who ever lived and a fabulous teacher. See, in the late 50s, he was at Caltech. And the people at Caltech were worried that their undergraduate education in physics was not enough to understand even the faintest thing that their star professors were doing like Richard Feynman. So they asked him, because he was an excellent teacher, to teach their two-year undergraduate course in physics. And he did, and they recorded everything. They made it into a book. It's called Feynman's Lectures in Physics. Really, really well done. But Feynman was not that interested in history. He was interested in discovering new things. He was about to win a Nobel Prize. Like, that's fine. But the problem was he would do stuff like say, I don't have the time to talk about history. You can just look it up in the encyclopedia if you want to. Nice. And that's what he said. So everyone got the impression that the history was cute and interesting, but not vital, not informative, just something you can do on your own. And then every layer of physics turned into one version of this incredibly advanced physics class for physics majors at Caltech. And so even when we teach freshman physics, where we simplify the equations as much as possible, we still put it in the format that Feynman did, like the order that Feynman did. We always start with mechanics and parabolas. Why? Because Feynman started there. We always, we do it the exact same way. We just simplify it as much as possible. And then we wonder why it doesn't resonate. Because we're taking this super advanced high math thing and trying to make it simple. That doesn't mean anything to people. And I feel like I taught it that way. And I just like, and now I'm thinking, I think it's time to rethink how we present this. Yeah, that's so, it's so powerful what you're talking about, because it's, you know, if, we, if we're the only reason why we're teaching it the way we're teaching it is because someone a long time ago said, this is the way it needs to be done, you know, and, it, and we don't understand that that's why we're teaching it the way we're teaching it. <laughs> That's even worse. And, it, you know, and what's what's amazing to me is that, you know, it, they've really removed, and I know part of it is time. And I, so don't get me wrong. I mean, all my listeners, someone is looking at, you know, thinking about time and how you can only teach so much stuff in a class anyway when it's history related because, you know, you got to you got to show how it's all connected over a period of time and so forth like this. But it's uh, it, it's something that when you pull out the stories, when you don't, connected and you don't realize that there's reasons why they did what they did i mean it's just missing just a huge part of understanding don't take this stuff for granted because the people the people who were messing with it way back when i'm just amazed that there weren't more you know uh, today we had a massive uh, you know tragedy as so and so was shocked by <laughs> some bolt that just generated out of this machine he was making we have no clue what that's all about but we've locked up the machine you know it's <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, uh, two points about that, though. The first thing is Feynman didn't say we should teach physics to in the beginning like that. He just said in this advanced physics class for physics majors, he had so much material to cover that he didn't feel like he had time to cover the history. But also, I found that the history actually makes it easier to cover more material like 
Feynman took, I'd say about four weeks to cover Maxwell's equations. I can do it in an hour. Because, now, I won't teach as much of how to do the math in an hour, but I can introduce it well in an hour and possibly less because I have a new way of doing it that I'm working on based on the history because some of the names have gotten twisted over time and I want to go back to the originals and figure out how to make it more logical. But also like, I think the big time thing is not including the history in the story. The big time thing is knowing how to include the history in the time, in the story, because teachers need to not have to be the research person. Like <laughs> You're asking your teachers to individually research all this stuff is not sustainable. It's not, that's not what you can do, right? You have yeah. to make it so that teachers can just go, here's the information. I understand it a little better. Let me explain it to you, right? So um, that's actually what I'm working on now, <laughs> as well as my books and my videos, because I'm, I'm kind of a bit of a, bouncing all over the place, doing everything all at once kind of person. All is good. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I gotta, I gotta say this because what makes it, what makes that era such an era in which is they're messing with this stuff that they're able to actually be curious enough about it to make it, to stay with it. I mean, what, I mean, cause there's, there's stuff that's, it's standing in their way. There's barriers that they got, like you said earlier, they got to be careful. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> Can you just kind of talk to the idea of what's going on at that time that would make it kind of very lucrative to be able to pursue this stuff? I, I don't think it's, it's not, are they inquisitive? I think people are naturally inquisitive, but I also think that science basically goes nowhere unless your country has a scientific peer reviewed paper. So France had a king who built Versailles and he liked science and he started a science. Um, I think the oldest science peer reviewed thing and soon peer reviewed paper. And soon there was so much science coming out of France. In fact, this Fran French was the language of science for a long, long time because nice. of that. And um, the Charles II grew up in France and then he went back to England. And then after, so his father gets his head chopped off, right? You know, your history, All right? Right. And he right. goes off to France. He grows up in France. He's basically French. He goes back to England. What does he do? Well, he impregnates every pretty girl he can find. And also he starts a lot of science programs. Nice, nice. <laughs> And then England starts to promote things. And then there was science things in Germany. But it was only basically these three countries that sort of gatekeep kept everything for a while. And then it was only in 1820 when this Danish man named Hans Christian Orsted discovered that electricity in a wire could move a compass and a magnet. And that that connection between electricity and magnetism is it that that was the spark it was just going slow and you know people were discovering one thing or another thing another thing and then 1820 hit and then suddenly the like the engines are revving and then everyone's just going and so i feel like it's not that they were inquisitive it i mean i feel like there's inquisitive people everywhere and there is all of these things everywhere. But once you have a system where people can get paid for their work and or do you know what I mean? There's and there's ways for yes. people to promote it. Then suddenly it blossoms. And the United States, it was because a bunch of people made a ton of money during the Civil War. They made a ton of money with the trains and the whatever. And those people like, well, I made money with trains. Let's try electricity. Let's try this. And they promoted a lot of people who had a lot of crackpot ideas, but also a lot of people who had great ideas. And that's why we had so much innovation in the United States. 
That's so amazing because that's, you know, and, and I think it's so important for people to know this because there's, it's not like luck. I mean, it's not that they all moved into the same area and someone said, hey, I'm working on electricity. You're working on electricity? Yeah, I'm working on electricity. No, it didn't work <laughs> that way. I mean, it's, and, and there's no rules in those. There's no, you know, there's no OSHA, I guess is what I want to say. There's no, you know, they're not worried about falling off a ladder. And if they did, they don't do that one again. And then there, and there's, I mean, it, there's this, this cool stuff that it eventually is going to have such a role in our lives. And, you know, one of the things that I think is amazing is that you include this story about whether they could reanimate a frog or not. And I think that's so cool because there's people who thought that they could actually use the, that the body had electricity inside of it and we can use that to bring a dead frog back to life again. So, Or a dead person, but in a way they were right. Right. Like if you're quick enough, you can use a defibrillator and bring a dead person back to life. I mean, that's how they would think it. Right. 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 That's how they would see it. We don't think of it that way. We're like, you know, that person had a heart attack. They had a defibrillator. They it's their hearts working again. Yay. But they don't think i they just brought that person back to life with electricity, but that's exactly what they did. Yeah. So it's, it's amazing to look back on how these things evolve and rethink what we take for granted. And I think that's one of the joys of learning it through the history is that it's more meaningful because it, you can look at your everyday life and see it in a different way. It's so cool. Cause uh, you know, it is, it, we take it for granted, and so we kind of avoid the, the history or we know a little bit about it, but not enough. Just like, you know, one of the people that you can't have this discussion about without uh, mentioning Tesla at some point. And, uh, well, people know Tesla today for another reason, <laughs> and, but they're not quite sure. I'm pretty sure he existed in history, but I'm not quite sure uh, what that was all about. But it's, uh, it's a car now. So, uh, you know, I, uh, you know I, I just think it's... Um, an aspect of our, you know <laughs> of what we know and don't know and what we allow into our into our our worlds uh, um, about something so important because you think about what uh, I mean being able to have light at night in a house um, just the th- ills that it cured and the the stuff that allowed to take place because now you had light past a time in which uh, you're struggling to see anything so. Just good stuff. I, you know, one of the, um, one of the things I got to get you to talk about is I, I, you know, in studying this, I, I think if, you know, anybody in science leaves out the stories, they miss just such a cool part where people start realizing that you could, I mean, that it becomes like snake oil. The idea that I can, I can, you can cure everything with this or you can prevent this or that. What, how'd you talk about a little bit about that type of stuff, you know, as you're, reading these things and thinking about, uh, um, you know, because ultimately one of the things you end up with is you end up with the lightning tamers, your book. So you had to choose some things that you wanted to tell us. <laughs> so what about that? Um, well, uh, it's, I'm trying to think. It's funny because um, many, many years ago, I ended up helping someone edit a book on, it was called Non-Destructive Evaluation. It was using different science techniques to study things without harming them. You could use ultrasonics, you could use sound, you could use um, um, x-rays. And I helped with the x-ray chapter and I bumped into this website where they're talking about how crazy x-rays were treated when they were discovered, you know, poetry about those naughty runkin rays and you know oh my gosh no one will wear clothing after this because if they can (laughs) see your bones you might as well just go naked i'm like (laughs) okay and so it was sort of when i started studying this i had my eye open for like all the quirky weird stories and i'm also a big believer in telling those quirky weird stories because they serve two purposes in my mind The first purpose they tell is to make you think of that part of science in a different way. Like when this thing was invented, when the light bulb was invented, I mean, the practical light bulb was invented, people would travel for miles to go stare at a single light bulb. I mean, it was a big, big deal. And we don't think of it that way, but I think it's nice to like both this was exciting and this was dangerous. 
this. And I think the dangerous aspect we don't think about with general technology, but it really was. They didn't know what they were doing and people died all the time, like all the time. <laughs> but also the other part that I want to emphasize with telling these stories is that if our brains are wired to remember stories and we remember quirky stories better than we remember non quirky stories. It's just how we work. Right. You remember that time in high school when the kid, you know, nice, nice, yeah. you know, whatever they, something quirky and funny happened. You remember that forever. You can't remember the rest of it, <laughs> right. you know? And so part of the reason I want to tell these quirky stories is because that keeps that part in your brain. It helps you remember it and it helps put it in context. And it's fun to read. So like it's a sort of a it's useful in many, many, many ways, if that makes any sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense, especially because, you know, there's just so much of what they're doing is impactful on us. Just even stuff that's just implied that's going on that if you don't tell so many stories, the kids can never make the connection that uh, there's other stuff that they're learning. For example, um, I mentioned before, there's no rules. I mean, they don't have OSHA wandering around and going, you know, get off that ladder. Um, are you wearing rubber soled suit shoes when you're doing this? Are you, you know, there's all kinds of things that there's no rules for. Well, <laughs> because what they're doing, eventually they're going to, you know, people associate with them are going to go, you know, we need to write this one down. Cause this is <laughs> one of the things that we need to, uh, we need to talk about. I mean, you know, and it's, uh, we need to make sure that people know about or aware. And I mean, you see these names, you see Volta and you see Ampere and you see, and it's like, Ooh, these look very familiar. You know, there, there's a reason <laughs> right. why they, you know, you re, their names were adjusted to be something that you think about in, in uh, this day. So, you know, let's, let's talk about some of those, you know, just the, some of that cool stuff with those stories that you're just kind of like, I mean, was there something there that you just went, Oh, I didn't know that one. Oh, gosh, so much. That's the problem. There's so much. Um, I, I think I mentioned it a bit. I was so when I taught physics, I'm, I was thinking about a guy named James Jewell. When I taught physics, I taught people that there was a power equation for electricity, how much power you get from electricity, I squared times R. And I think I vaguely knew it came from Jewell. And then I also knew the jewel had done something about energy and he had this thing that was dropping down and it made a paddle wheel spin and it heated up the water. But I didn't know why, what he was trying to convince people of. And I didn't know there was any connection between these two things. And so, I mean, I understood the rules themselves. I understood how the experiment worked, but I didn't understand the meaning of any of it. I didn't understand the inspiration of any of it. I just knew what it was. And so when I went into the history, uh, first I found out that he was just a, he was just working as a beer brewer. His whole family had a beer brewing company Excellent. and they had a little bit of money because it was a successful beer brewing company, but it wasn't like he was, you know, he didn't have a degree. He didn't have, he wasn't connected to universities, nothing. He was just a beer brewer who liked to do experiments on the side. Um, and he happened to be, have a tutor who was um, something Dalton. I forget his first name, who came up with the idea of atoms. I'm like, what? <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> so he's like, atoms explain everything. And I didn't know till I started studying the history that like at the time they knew about what we call kinetic energy the move energy of motion. They even called it energy. And they knew about like gravitational potential energy. They knew if you lifted up something, it had a thing that you could let go and it would turn into the went kinetic energy. And they knew about the whole idea of work, but they thought that heat was just a sink. Like you could drop something and it could turn into kinetic energy. You drop a ball, bounce, 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 it stops, right? Where's that energy go? Heat. Nice. But what did they think of it? They just thought heat was this endless sort of pile. They didn't think it was connected one to one. And Jewel was like, he was trying to make motors. 
And he was like, I can't get my motor to work very well. Maybe I'll study how the different parts of it. And that's how he got his power equation. And then he was like, wow, the energy I get from uh, the power, the energy over time that I get from my wires is the same as I get from my battery. And it's the same as the heat it makes. Like all these things are connected. And I was like, oh, that's why he did that experiment. That's what's going on. He's trying to show that heat is the same as the energy from lifting that object up. That just felt so much more profound to me, you know? And so even though that's a law of thermodynamics, I included a bit in that in my electricity because it came from electricity. And I just found it so profound. Like, what? That's crazy. Um, so that was one thing that I got. But there's so many that it's it's a little uh, difficult to think of them all. I got you. That makes uh, makes perfect sense. I mean, it. Uh, you know, it. There's just so much going on um, during that era. I, you know, one of the things that uh, we've kind of alluded to is that uh, it wasn't just the that they tell their colleagues or that they, or maybe they were afraid of it or whatever, but they, you know, they literally had to, to worry about, uh, you know, possibly offending somebody <laughs> that was a little powerful <laughs> um, or, or making some uh, poor choices of who their friends were. Can you just kind of talk to the, the history and the knowing uh, that you might, uh, you could anger the wrong person. Or sometimes they use that. There was, there was a lot about like rivalries and using those rivalries or avoiding the rivalries. And one of the great stories about that is there was a man in France named Abbe Nolay and he was, he became the favorite of the King of France by doing these crazy electricity experiments. And Benjamin Franklin was doing crazy electricity experiments in Philadelphia. And he had come up with this new theory of electricity before him there. Um, the idea was if you rub one kind of object, you get one kind of electricity, you rub the other kind of object, you get the other kind of electricity. One is resinous because it comes from resin like wax. One is vitreous because it comes from glass, which I think the Latin or Greek word for glass is resin. Um, sorry. Whatever that is. And so but they knew there were two kinds of electricity, but they didn't know that they were. Um, and Benjamin Franklin said, no, no, no. It's not that you rub one thing, you get one kind of electricity. You rub the other thing, you get another kind of electricity. I think you rub things and the electricity moves from one object to the other. And I'm going to call too much electricity positive. I'm going to call too little electricity negative. And that was the other thing. When you read these old papers, they'll just say like, hey, why don't we for now call it this? And you're like, what? That's all the thought you put into it. <laughs> and we're still using it. Um, but so, yeah, he did that. And he, and, you know, and when he wanted to have his and then his friend wanted to have his letters published as a book. And when he wanted to have it published in France, he didn't give it to Abbe Nolay. Because he knew Nole would hate it because it was a different theory than the thing he'd been promoting this whole time. Right. So he gives it to Nole's rival nice. who hires some people to do great demonstrations. And every time they do the demonstration, they go, this is from Philadelphia. These are the Philadelphia experiments. Even uneducated, low class people from the colonies. I mean, France didn't think lowly. Necess but, you know, they thought less of people living in colonies. They're, even they can do better than you, Mr. Nolay, uh, Monsieur Nolay. And so, I mean, and that's part of why they tried to, you know, get electricity from a cloud, not with a key and a kite, but with a pointed stick. All of these things are connected. And then when Ben Franklin came to France to try to get money, he totally amped up that whole, I'm just an ignorant colonist. He wore this like coonskin hat and he's like, he didn't even try to have a good French accent. He was just like, I'm just an ignorant country bumpkin from Philadelphia. Like it wasn't our biggest city. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. That's uh, 
something else. I, you know, I, I think that, uh, I mean, I want to remind everybody that, uh, we're going to start kind of taking a look at a little bit more at your book. Um, and the book is called the lightning tamers. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's just amazing to me is that you didn't end up with more people dying from just exposing themselves to these types of experiments. I mean, you know, it's, uh, um, I mean, what do you think about that? Well, honestly, I think they didn't mostly die because they didn't, it was really hard to make this stuff powerful. It took them a long time. So mostly they could mess around all they want. And the worst thing they got is a bad shock that they didn't want to get again for the kingdom of France. Like, you know, with uh, there's this jar that uh, Nole called an, a laden jar. We call it a capacitor and, or condenser. And like it can store charge and give you pretty bad shock afterwards. And he would shock like 150 soldiers at a time and monks in their outfits and, you nice. know, for the entertainment of the king. And I'm sure it hurt. But I'm also sure it's really hard to kill someone with that. Like they tried to kill animals and they're like, we can kill a little bird, but that's all we can do. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, please stop. But also, like, even though it was dangerous, it wasn't that dangerous for a really long time. And so that's why when they discovered x-rays and radium, they were like, oh, this is fine. There's no, it just didn't seem logical that any science would be dangerous. I mean, occasionally it's dangerous, but compared to their regular life, it really wasn't that dangerous. You know, one of the things that I just think is amazing is that even though there's they're not killing themselves and there's, there are people who are charlatans and they've figured out is it kind of a social status to have somebody shock you at one time or, you know, whatever the cures, you know, it, ills may be cured because of whatever they're doing. As we come forward, there's so many things happening. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because like you, you mentioned specifically, I gotta, I gotta mention a couple of these before we finish up. I mean, um, you know, Michael Faraday is a name you cannot talk about in this. You can, you can, even if you know nothing about Michael Faraday, you've probably heard on some show somebody talk about a Faraday cage or something like this. You've probably heard them mention him, whether it's real science or not. They've probably brought his name into it, and that and he exists today. But you bring out this the stuff that it, it's highly possible that uh, he never had any impact on the world just simply because he had all kinds of other things going on in his life. And I was I thought that was cool. <laughs> I, I I find. I I'm was surprised that Faraday was so ridiculously influential. And part of the reason that we've heard of the Faraday cage, but most people haven't really heard of him, is he was also very, he was a very um, religious man and a very, very much against superficial adornments. He ref the queen wanted to give him a knighthood. He refused. People wanted to do statue with him at the time. He refused. They wanted to do all sorts. They wanted him to be president of the society. He refused. He just, he's like, and when he was dying, he was like, I want my funeral to be, I want my grave to be plain. I want my funeral. I want everything to be as plain and simple as possible. And so in many ways, his influence has sort of diminished in people's minds, but I cannot think of a more influential physicist than Michael Faraday at all in any way. And I mean, in this book, I talk about his influence on the development of electricity for the house and the, you know, the generator and the transformer and all of that stuff came straight from Faraday. But also, and all the names, I mean, like all the names, <laughs> cathode and anode and ion. And I mean, just like dielectric, and everything. But then also, he also not only came up with, he was also a very, very, very influential theoretical physicist with no math skills. But he came up with the idea of electric fields and magnetic fields and that light was an electromagnetic wave. 
And he was the reason that a guy named James Clerk Maxwell wrote what's called Maxwell's Equations. And that's the reason that Hertz discovered the radio wave. He said, I did this to prove Faraday Maxwell's theories correct. And so we we're doing this because of Faraday in in multiple ways. And he almost he was a poor boy with no education and no connections. And he only got a job in science because one, his boss, which he has as a teenager who working as a book binder, let him read the books. <laughs> and and two, he lucked into a job working for the world's most famous chemist. And that's how he ended up in science. But like and he only got that job because the chemist had a bottle washer who got in a fight with another kid delivering things and he fired the bottle washer and that's how Faraday got a job in science. And then it makes me wonder, like if they hadn't gotten the fight, would we have, I mean, I could imagine us having generators. I cannot imagine us having radio waves. I cannot imagine us having quantum mechanic E equals MC squared also came from Maxwell's equations. Like how would that happen? without this strange, beautiful brain and this fist fight. <laughs> I just the serendipity, the amount of like of like a twist where it ever all of history hangs on the one little pinpoint. It just happens over and over again. It's astonishing to me. I feel like people wouldn't believe me. If I wrote a fiction story like this, they'd go, okay, that's not realistic. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's, oh my gosh. It's, it's just amazing that, you know, and some of this that, that you're talking about, I mean, the, the, all of their work is so interconnected. It's so, you know, it's, it's so dependent on other people, which I mean, I kind of going back to something you said earlier about how, um, you know, you don't, a lot of people don't really want to know all the details of the real story because they're afraid that, you know, they're going to end up, someone's going to end up suing somebody because uh, it, oh, it's not exactly, uh, that's not how we thought it was or something like that. I, you know, and it's, it's cause it's a little convoluted. This, this person used this person's idea to make sure that this part of the experiment happened. And lo and behold, I've got this happening. And I, it's so cool. Cause you show all that interconnectivity and things going on and, you know, and I, we're, we're about to finish up and which is really difficult for me. Cause I could talk to you about this stuff for a long time. And the, uh, but you know, from you, you talk about the telegraph and the importance of that, and we and we find a very familiar name in there, um, one by the name of Morse, and uh, yes. you know, and then a little bit later we have uh, we have a guy named Bell, you know, and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, and and then later we got uh, Edison and we got Westinghouse and we got them pushing each other, and you know, got to get this done. We got to get. I I just don't think people understand that. Uh, I I think. You know, the stories are so important to understanding really what was going on at the time and how little we may have known or not known. I think also when people have an interest in the history of science, they tend to focus on one person or one time period. And I think that's a big mistake because if you only focus on that time period, it's easy to get diverted by the claims they were making at that time. And especially when people are inventing things that can make money with it, they tend to exaggerate what they've done. And certainly that's true with Edison <laughs> and, or what they can accomplish. And so it makes it so it's difficult to know what's really going on. And it's so much easier if you start earlier. If you start earlier, you can see how it evolved. You can see what they did versus what they claim they did. And I think that the just focusing on one time period gives a distorted view of the history. So people think, well, I know the history. I read a few biographies about these two people. I'm good. And almost all of them are so, you know they'll start in maybe 1860 i'm like that's not that's not a good place to start you should start in 1580 um in my view 
Um, <laughs> nice, nice. I like that. Let's leave out a whole bunch of stuff that if if you don't start in the right places, because there's it's just all, all all important to what eventually comes out of it, which is you know the power coming out of the wall, <laughs> right? Or any kind of science you're discovering. I mean, or talking about right. It all was evolved from way before that. You know, if we're talking about x-rays, we shouldn't start with Röntgen. It That's not the important place to start. <laughs> if you got to go back a little bit and say what inspired it, or it doesn't really make sense, what's controversial? What are they doing differently? How was it appreciated or not appreciated at the time? And all of that is part of the story. And I think once you learn that, you realize that science isn't just these isolated ideas, but a river of ideas. And that is both inspirational and helpful for understanding the ideas and how you can contribute, you know? Yeah. So I think that's that's very important. <laughs> so much so, so much so. I, I Kathy, just an amazing um, focus you've got and in, uh, in the importance of history and science they really shouldn't be separated and and you've created this awesome book that the historian of me just loves and, and, i mean it, it, the book is titled the lightning tamers true stories of the dreamers and schemers who harnessed electricity and, and transformed our world i mean it's it's just so cool I, people are got to want to know how to reach out to you and find out where your youtube channel is and all that stuff to find out more where would you send somebody um the easiest one is my website I, I have a theme. Everything is Kathy loves physics. So my website is with a K. My website is www.kathylovesphysics.com. My email is kathylovesphysics at gmail.com. My YouTube channel is Kathy loves physics. I think it's Kathy loves physics and history. Um, but if you type in Kathy loves physics, I'll pop up. Um, that's all I do. I, I tried to do other things like um, uh, Facebook and Twitter and I think I've commented twice on both of them and <laughs> everyone's like, do you exist there? I'm like, not really, honestly. That's so cool. <laughs> Very but um, yes, my email, website, um, and a YouTube channel. I think that's, that's enough social media for me. There you go. And that's <laughs> makes it easy to remember too. So good stuff. I'll put that stuff in my show notes. So it's easy for them to connect with you. And I, and as we're finishing up, I got one last question to ask you and it, and it goes like this. Uh, do you have a teacher in your past who made a, a difference in your life or uh, just someone who, if you got a chance to say thank you, uh, what would you say to them and uh, who would that be? I'd actually like to pick two teachers. I had a high school, both physics teachers, a high school physics teacher and a college physics teacher. I feel like mostly we mentioned high school physics teachers. Those tend to be the ones that inspire us, but I was inspired by both. Um, my high school teacher is named Tucker Hyatt. And I actually, um, I occasionally talk to him. <laughs> He's uh, on my, I've emailed him. And uh, so that he, I think he knows that I found him so inspirational. And I, he took my love of physics that I got from the Exploratorium and put some, put some equations to it, put some, put it together, but let me think of it in my own way and be unique with it. And I really like that. And I, I loved his class. And um, the other one is a college teacher named Herr. Um, I always remember him as Herr Mueller because he was German and had a very thick German accent. And I just loved his enthusiasm. I mean, he clearly just loved physics and he is and you know he'd do all these little crazy experiments and half the time they wouldn't go right he tried to show momentum by sitting in a rolling chair and pressing the um the fire extinguisher pressing the fire extinguisher and having the chair go backwards but it went so far he ran out of the nice. blew him out of the room yeah. and i'm like i love it I love all of this. I love the enthusiasm and the fact that he just, he clearly knew a lot of physics. He was really advanced physics, but his love for the subject still shined through. And it kind of taught me that you can do the advanced stuff and still love it, you know? 
And uh, that was that was pretty awesome. And I haven't talked to him since. I, I have no idea where he is. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's cool. Thanks for sharing those stories. Uh, is it's always cool to hear about how people have uh, impacted others, and I and I love that. And it fits really well with your stories uh, in your book. Um, you know, the, the book's just amazing because you bring back the understanding that that history and science they go together, and it, you gotta can't leave that out because otherwise it's just boring and it's not boring and, and especially not what they're doing. And then you learn a little bit more about who these people were and the stuff that was going on in their lives. I mean, thanks so much for talking with me, Kathy, your book, the lightning tamers, true stories of the dreamers and schemers who harness electricity and transform our world is awesome. Um, you know, what an amazing look at uh, our world that, uh, and so, so much stuff we take for granted, wishing you success in all you do. Thank you so much, Stephen. I really appreciate it. Hey, you have been listening to Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12, a podcast to help you help kids achieve their dreams. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the podcast network based in Canada called Voice Ed Radio. Voice Ed Radio, your voice is right. The opinions expressed on Teaching Learning Leading K-12 are those of the guests and hosts. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is intended to share ideas, advice, and suggestions. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is produced for educational purposes. Hey, thanks for listening. It would be awesome if you visited my website at stephenmaletto.com and connected with me, left a review, and listened to more episodes. And by the way, you could also share it with your friends, with your family, and uh, your colleagues. Thanks so much. You're awesome.